Hello, everyone, and welcome to uh, a kind of a surprise stream. Uh, this was a thing that we decided to do just just a little bit ago, and we're doing a little bit of, of self-promotion, <laughs> which, you know, admittedly is not our strong suit. Um, I'm Sean. That's Ian. We're the Mythos Busters. I'm really starting from level zero on this, aren't I? Holy shit. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, I suppose the, the first thing to open with is that, uh, we, we obviously had Arkham Knights, uh, announced by, uh, it was either FFG or FFZ, I don't know who technically announced it, it's, it's actually thrown by the, the Zenter, right? Yeah, I, I think both advertised it, but I think the initial announcement was from the Zenter. Okay. So, joint effort, ostensibly then, but, uh, uh, so... It wasn't exactly enough notice for us to do anything with. And obviously, if you're a listener to our actual podcast, which is a thing I, I find myself taking for granted a lot, uh, and, and then come to understand that even the people who listen to the podcast aren't up on it, obviously. Like, if you think about it for a second, that's logical. Um, but if you listen to the podcast, uh, we've announced that our official Iron Man run that we normally do at Arkham Knight is not going to be... None of us can even show up because they announced and um, planning requires the bedrock of the ability to plan. So here we are, uh, BusterCon. The official Iron Man is going to be held at BusterCon, which is our con that we're throwing, again, at the FFC, uh, at the, the Game Center in May of 2022. And uh, I swear it's not not in protest, but uh, as as we were kind of uh, you know coming to terms with the fact that we weren't going to be playing Iron Man, um, Ian and I got to talking. Well, actually, we we threw it out there to the podcast. You, you and I were the only ones who could show up. Uh, we're going to do a virtual Iron Man this year. We're not going to commit to a a biggin like we did. Uh, we're not doing TDE. Um, we're going to do Return to the Night of the Zealot as a virtual Iron Man this year. And we're going to do it on uh, Sunday, October 24th, which is Sunday, like, butting up against Arkham Knights. So I don't know if it's technically part of the event, but the event will still be mm -hmm. in, in its afterglow. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, uh, so this, this is just a thing we threw together, and uh, we just wanted to announce it here. And normally when we do an Iron Man, we, we have an episode beforehand where we really break down the strategy of the campaign and talk about the decks we're bringing and have a preparation episode prep episode if you will. how have we never uh and, we will and now <laughs> this iron man is admittedly going to be a lot more loosey-goosey and casual than our ones of the past because this is something that we've we've decided we were going to do like within the last week uh and, and you know, we're not going to do our, our full gamut of marketing for it but anyone who wants to play along or just have us on in the background while you're playing your own iron man uh we, we'd love for you to join in the collective spirit yeah i definitely don't have the like three different spreadsheets that i usually have to prep for an iron man yeah. and the list of like all my upgrades so yeah it's it's a little bit more loose but again this is technically since we're delving into the returns this time it's you know a campaign that we've played before but we're doing the return version which of course there's differences in the return but mm -hmm. I, and i know we did mention in the past that at some point we wanted to delve into the return versions to do iron man but obviously that's kind of hard to do when we're still doing regular campaigns so yeah we're kind of dipping our toes in like we're technically like a year behind on the releases now mm -hmm. thanks to covid so uh um well i suppose we didn't we didn't miss yeah, we just, just did because it because of the releases. The yeah. overall release. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, so let's talk a little bit about uh, about what we're gonna be bringing. Mm -hmm. Um, so Ian, I will throw your deck up. Okay. Who are you playing? I am playing Amanda Sharp, which is a little bit of a departure from my usual Iron Man fare because as is probably not a huge surprise to anyone watching, I usually play a rogue or a survivor. So <laughs> if we run down who I've played in the past, I played Safina and Rita and Tony. Man. We've done three. I've, I've been part of three so far or four. Am Wait, I missing an Iron Man? Did you play Finn or did Nick play? 
Nick played Nick Finn. Nick played Finn. Yeah, All right, yeah I played Safina for Carcosa, mm -hmm. Rita for TFA, and um, Tony for TCU. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Yeah, so I was kind of in my head thinking I should really play a Seeker, because actually when I play in groups, I very rarely pay, play a kind of Kluver Seeker role. Uh, just It's kind of just doesn't really attract my attention usually so i was thinking okay who do i want to play and you like there's one seeker way too much way too much <laughs> <laughs> i do i do <laughs> i'd rather evade than seek um <laughs> but when i was trying to think of a seeker amanda leapt to mind just because she's like my favorite seeker she is a seeker that i really enjoy playing so mm -hmm. it was pretty much as simple as that not a lot of kind of gaming the campaign or thinking about what was best i just wanted to play a seeker that was interesting to me so yeah amanda fantastic um i is... see you're going dream diary with uh uh leaning back in his desk shrewd analysis yep yeah, I am. Um, so when I was c putting together this deck, one of the big campaign specific things that leapt out wasn't necessarily anything to do with the campaign itself, but just how short it is and how much XP. So I was trying to think of um, what kind of deck I can build that would just need a few key upgrades. Originally, I was thinking since the campaign is short, I'm not going to include any of the little seeker or side questy things, um, cards. But when I was looking through the list, I kind of do love Dream Diary and Amanda. Um, and it's usually pretty easy to trigger as long as you can draw it. So I was like, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll go Dream Diary. Um, I'm actually not 100% if I'm going to use the shrewd analysis or not. I just included it in case. Um, it'll kind of depend on how much XP we get. In the gathering um, specifically. Yeah, it'll pretty much be a post-gathering call where, where I'll decide whether I want to save that XP or not. Um, and then some... So the rest of the kind of asset kit is pretty self-explanatory, I think. Fingerprint kit um, to get some extra clues. I threw in a cult lexicon because I'm trying to include a good amount of damage because even though... I think I'm going to be getting more clues in general, and Sean is going to be getting doing more damage. We wanted to make it balanced, especially I think with Midnight Masks in mind, because those cultists go all over the map. So I think everyone needs to be able to whack a cultist, essentially. <laughs> um, yeah, and so return to Midnight yeah. Masks it puts them even farther <laughs> out of reach than the normal one. So. <sighs> Yeah, and increases their health in some instances, and it's it's just all bad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, yeah, and the hardest choice for the assets was really the ally. I decided to go with lab assistant, which is not a usual choice for Amanda. But with Amanda, I don't know your experience with Amanda, but I just find myself having a very big hand with Amanda a lot of times, and mm -hmm. times where I like have to discard down to hand size. Mm -hmm. And so with Lab Assistant, I was thinking, and with Dream Enhancing Serum, which I threw in there, I was thinking that might be a way to just keep my hand topped up past the usual hand limit. Sure. Yep. I, the, I've built two different Amanda decks, and I definitely like the one with Lab Assistant. Because, mm. uh, just, I don't know. I think Lab Assistant is an underrated card. It is. It is. I've used very, it more and more. Card. I'm trying to remember who did I use in some of my other Amanda. Probably Doctor Milan, but sure. I often found with Amanda, I end up ended up with way more resources than I needed. Just a big surplus because she's mostly committing cards versus spending. So, yeah, skipped over Milan this time. He he doesn't have enough work. He deserves a vacation. Uh, well, and your curve for, is is pretty reasonable. Yeah, so many it, of your it's cards a bunch of are cards for committing essentially. So. Yeah, a bunch of cards at two and just a few more than that. Um, for events, uh, again, I included some damage events. Like, I've got a plan and a call and vacation. Um, a lot of times I might only include one of those, but I included both, again, because I want to kill some cultists. Uh, logical reasoning, because there are some uh, horror um, dealers in terms of the encounter cards. And also some ones with a terror trait. I, I, if, well, when we talk about Sean's build, he can tell you who he was going to play versus who he ultimately decided on. But <laughs> if, if he would have played who he originally was going to play, I probably would have had two copies of logical reasoning. Um, 
And then uh, an interesting one that I included is the truth beckons, um, which I think can do some work in Midnight Mass and Devour Below in terms of moving across the map quickly. Yeah, you just pick pick a location past the cultist you want to get to. <laughs> just, excuse me, just going to move. Um, and then skills, you know, I don't think anything too unexpected. D- deduction, Eureka, Inquiring Mind, Promise of Power, Unexpected Courage, Perception. Um, as is usually the case, the hardest part was making some cuts, and I had to make some painful cuts. Um, I really wanted to sneak in one copy of a cheeky persuasion to get rid of some cultists, um, but I had to cut that for space. Mm. What else did I Is cut? Persuasion test willpower or uh, intellect? Intellect. Okay. Intellect test. Um, in terms of, I guess I should talk about my ending build too, what I'm trying to work up to, because uh, there were some things I cut there as well. So the main upgrades I'm looking at are Dream Diary, like we talked about. Um, the upgraded occult lexicon, which I haven't used yet. Have you used that one yet? Uh, upgraded? No, I have not. Yeah, that came out in Return to TCU, so it's one of the newer cards. It's the one that just bumps the two to a three, right? Or yep. shuffle it back in. And yeah, so you can either turn it into a, a cycle or um, bump up the damage. Uh, and then Pathfinder, because I mean, come on, <laughs> especially in Return to Nazi. Like one of the things me and Sean did talk about is how much mobility is important in the campaign. So Pathfinder, of course, um, upgraded deduction with Amanda is just ridiculous, especially if you combine it with Pathfinder. You can just scoot around and just gobble up a bunch of clues in one round. And then if I have the XP space, I'd like to throw in a, a single copy of Justify the Means for Devour Below when you're getting down towards the end and you just need to auto-pass. Boy. Um, throw that so, under Amanda and just boop, boop, boop. <laughs> go ahead and upgrade into Armageddon. Yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> but we'll see something. if that happens. Um, one of the upgrades, I, I had to cut a few upgrades for, for XP because I wanted to stick to like around-ish 20 XP. And I'm not even sure if we'll get that. We'll see. Um, but I, what is the newer card? It's a permanent. You, you have like extra deck space, but you start with some random skills and you can draw them. It's oh. like ancient knowledge or something like yeah. that. Yeah, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that one seems yeah, I really wanted to try that with Amanda, but I had to cut it. I think the ones I narrowed down are just kind of more core to the deck. So, uh, yeah. And as we're talking about XP, it's probably relevant to say that we plan currently Ancestral Knowledge. Mm. Thanks, Tika. Uh, mm-hmm. um, it's probably worthwhile to say that we plan at this point to do a side scenario. Mm-hmm. Um, we've talked about a couple different things. I don't know if we've fully firmed our decision yet. <laughs> Uh, based on who I'm playing, I have a certain thought, but we're going to have to see how... I think we're going to have to see how the gathering goes, right? Because yeah. the amount of XP we spend on a side quest is important if we're technically playing by the rules, which we do. Iron Man is serious business. We always play by the <laughs> rules. I think we're planning on running up the scoreboard on a return to gathering, or hoping, I should say, rather than planning. And... uh any XP we get after that will be gravy. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Excellent. All right. So what do you got brewing? Uh-huh. <laughs> um, <laughs> so my initial thought when we were talking about this uh, was to run Silas, because I think one of the big things that Return to Night of the Zealot really does is the biggest thing that sticks out in my mind is it makes the cultists in Midnight Mass, uh, it puts them farther out of your reach very specifically mm-hmm. so it makes them more threatening to doom clock um yeah the gathering just kind of becomes a real boy scenario uh <laughs> uh and you know i i did sense a whole lot of difference to uh devour below like there's a couple extra locations um retry is a little bit worse but like ultimately it's still pretty devour below that's that's kind of my thought so Silas seemed like a good idea because he had a really he has a lot of mobility tricks like put nipple in Silas. Mm-hmm. You can do mm-hmm. some zipping. 
But as I looked at the uh, the cards again that were added for, I saw more willpower tests and more horror pressure, and ultimately decided that I was going to account for that. In Silas, I was probably going to end up playing Pete Sylvester, and that is just too basic bitch for me. I can't do it. I can't. <laughs> I can't do it. Uh, so instead, since we're playing like this alternate version of uh, Night of the Zealot, I went with my old Zealot Bay. Uh, we're gonna. Oh, whoops! I, there we go. We're gonna do. We're gonna do some parallel Agnes up in this, up in this campaign, and I'm really looking forward to it. This is basically the the solo parallel Agnes deck that I've taken up against a couple campaigns. One of my favorite solo decks. Uh, it doesn't take a whole lot of XP to start, you know, start rolling really hard. So. Uh, so yeah, uh, it's it's uh, Spellstorm Agnes. I'm using both Parallel Front and Parallel Back, so you'll notice mm-hmm. five card deck. It is tight. Oh God, those <laughs> cuts were painful. <laughs> I cut it down to thirty. Like I've played, I've played Parallel Agnes a lot at this. I but I mm-hmm. cut it down to thirty. I'm like, all right, cool, looks tight. And then I went to save it and saw that little. I saw the <laughs> lamp. I saw the lamp on Arkham DB. I'm like, no, I have to cut five, five more, more cards. It's so painful. Um. So anyway, <laughs> that's what ultimately ended up happening. So uh, the the idea of this deck is to really actually try to make some use out of the heirloom. Um. So to get the heirloom, I've got backpack in here. Level zero is pretty rough. I include it just because late game digging for something uh uh but i'm more in the i'm more in this for backpack level um so uh go get the heirloom i'm gonna get some some relic hunter up in here uh pretty quickly uh and then uh probably upgrade uh one right of seeking i think just to have a couple in the deck to have a couple options for for investigating would be good Uh, because the nice thing is i can just upgrade into level two right of seeking leave the level zero in there just yeah. Um. So so ultimately, I don't think my deck is going to get above like twenty seven cards. Uh. But anyway, ultimately, ultimately, the ally that I that I upgrade into from David uh, should be Diana Esperance, uh, because mm-hmm. putting Spectral Razor or Storm of Spirits or uh, probably going to take a Time Warp at some point. Mm-hmm. Um. Basically, the most fun I've had with this deck is I just give Diana Esperance a lot of fun things that I could throw on her. Put it in this this Agnes deck, and it generally it generally does good things. So, mm-hmm. uh, so yeah, so that's that's my spell storm Agnes. That's my Zealot Bay. It's gonna be a lot of fun. Now, have you informed Diana yet of your choice? <laughs> <laughs> no, I was actually gonna say, you know, you you said that you know, uh, uh, Louver Seeker stepping out of your Iron Man wheelhouse a little bit. I have only played Mystic in Iron Man one time. Uh, mm. Which was my Diana in in TFA. Played Mark for Dunwich. I played. Uh, I play in Carcosa. I boy, I played Daisy in Carcosa. I played mm-hmm. Diana in TFA, and then I played Patrice, which you know, it was a pretty purple mm. deck, but not technically a. Mm. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> technically red. It was a. Yeah, was that's a, true. I think of the busters. I, I I think of the busters I keep to the class the most for Iron Man because I'm thinking of everyone else and they mix it up pretty much. Like Nick played Finn and Lola. Um, Lola. Scott played, he did play York. Who did Scott play for TCU? Um, it was Min. a Seeker, I'm pretty yeah, sure. Min. Min, yeah, yeah. It's a little bit all over the place. Yeah. <clears throat> So, uh, but but I'm happy to do it because this deck, when it gets rolling, is so fun. Um, when you mm-hmm. get uh, when you get the hallowed mirror out and you start cycling your uh, um, no, song of thing melody, <laughs> soothing melody. Yeah, what is that thing called? Soothing melody. When you're yeah, cycling your you soothing melody with your heirloom out, uh, the smooth jazz. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, when you're cycling it, anytime you play, uh, 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 oh my god, I just did this. I just went through this process. Anytime you play a soothing melody, you can 
pick a horror, not necessarily to to reduce the cost because it doesn't need it, but to cycle it back in. And then you draw oh, two cards right. from your deck. Uh, and and you can, you know, net you only healed one damage if you're taking it off of Agnes, but at the end of the day, if you've got some actions left, you can just really start this. Just, oh, it's so good. I love this. I'm yeah, I always think about can... parallel Agnes in terms of the cost reduction, but that cycling is a lot of times what's super crucial. Super crucial, especially if you plan to lean into the heirloom and you plan to use the five mm -hmm. card deck. Like it makes a difference. Mm -hmm. Um, dive into that. So yeah, so that's my deck. Uh, overall strategy, Ian. Um, you know when any you know we talk about the strategies for the different campaigns, we almost never talk about Night of the Zealot because the strategy for Night of the Zealot is play Arkham Horror, all yeah. the vanilla Arkham Horror cards. Uh, you know, there's some timing st strategies and stuff like that that everyone learned to play through the core. But what do you think that uh, return adds in that? Well, when I was looking through the cards. <clears throat> earlier the new the new return cards that were added i noticed this strong theme of like hating on your hand like discarding cards from your hand or punishing you if you don't have enough cards in hand like i think there's one devour below that just straight up kills you if you're left with no cards in hand yep um so when i was looking through that i was like oh amanda was actually a good choice for this because i should have a nice robust hand to counter those so that's good i won't have to worry about those effects too much although they might discard a, a good card from my hand or something but i don't think there's anything really where i look at it and say oh we have to do this differently in return versus vanilla i think it just makes some things harder <clears throat> especially midnight mass but I think we're pretty much going to be using a standard Midnight Mass strategy, which is get down what you need, your like basic rig, and go fast. Like, I don't know how else to play Midnight Mass, really. <laughs> For real. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I find that the key question for that scenario is just always like, how... How bare bones do you want to go? Like, what's what's the basic rig that you want to run with? And how much time do you want to take to get that out? <clears throat> yeah, definitely need to hit the ground running a little bit. Campaign, even the other short ones. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I guess the only other thing would just be for Devour Below, because it does have some stuff that tests different skills for investigating. Um... But I think that's where, uh, like, just the game out Amanda, like, she's, I can hit lots of different stats potentially. So, should be fine compared to your average seeker. Yep. Here's hoping. Now, have we decided who's going to be lead and do we want Lita? Mm, I mean, both good questions. I'd love Lita, but I'm not going to, like, fight hard for her. <clears throat> Yeah, I'm not I'm not super invested. I think we can play it by ear. And as far as who's lead, I'm not sure yet. Do you have a strong preference? Well, I have less sanity than you, so that's my, that's my only thought is you have more sanity. So you have, yeah. you have more sanity than you. That's uh, true. Yeah, I could probably be lead, <laughs> I think. <laughs> but um yeah, I I the one thing I often can't remember is how much horror pressure this deck ends up doing in the early stages. Because once you get mm. a couple things upgraded, there's there's a lot there's pressure. But um, you know, hallowed mirror generally. Yeah, we'll we'll call that on the spot. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, uh, thanks everyone for joining us, and and do mm -hmm. stay tuned. We are going to be streaming Sunday, the twenty fourth of October. 12 p.m. Central Time. This return to the Night of the Zealot with an added extra bonus uh, uh, side scenario TBD. And uh, we're just going to see how it goes. Mm -hmm. It's going to be fun. It's going to be the greater part of a day. And, uh, and I'm very, very much here for it. Yeah. Our first two-person Iron Man, so... True. I don't know about you, but I feel like two-person is a lot more pressure than four-person, because four-person, if you're not pulling your weight, it's like, okay, I'll take care of it, but two-person is kind of a... hide that shit under the table if, yep. if it's happening sometimes. <laughs> just sweep but... it right under. 
everyone else is so on that they don't even notice that you're not doing anything. <laughs> and everyone, every time we do Iron Man, everyone has one scenario where they are the boat yeah. anchor. And it is the worst when it's happening to you. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. But there's no hiding in two player. No, no. <laughs> All right. Uh, Well, thanks, everyone, for joining us. We're about to hop over into our Discord and record a a new episode of the podcast. Uh, So so if you're in our Discord, please come join us. If you're not in our Discord, get in our Discord. It's discord.gg slash mythosbusters. And uh, and we guys on October 24th, if not sooner. Bye.